characterizing spatial gene expression heterogeneity in spatial transcriptomics data using Moran's eye with Professor Jean Fan. Characterizing spatial gene expression heterogeneity is critical for understanding how cellular and molecular processes are orchestrated in the context of complex biological systems. Recent advancements in spatially resolved transcriptomics technologies now enable us to visualize simultaneously how thousands of genes are expressed within hundreds of thousands of cells within millimeter sections of thin tissues. This big data demands computational analyses to enable efficient identification of meaningful spatial patterns and relationships. In this lecture, we'll learn about how to distinguish spatially variable genes that exhibit coordinated spatial variation from genes that may exhibit high variability, but not in a spatially coordinated manner. Specifically, we'll learn about Moran's eye, a statistic originally developed in the context of geospatial information sciences. In spatial transcriptomics, we often have data that's represented as the positions of our cells and the gene expression measurements associated with these cells for hundreds to thousands of cells and thousands of genes. If we visualize this data by representing cells as points with the spatial positions encoded along the x and y axis and the gene expression magnitude encoded as a divergent color hue with red being high expression and blue being low expression, we can begin to see some spatial gene expression patterns. But of course, there's thousands of genes to look through, so we don't want to look through it manually, and instead we want to use statistics to help us filter and rank. Let's see how Moran's eye can help us accomplish this. Consider we have n cells, again visualized as points with the spatial positions encoded as the x and y axes. First, let's focus on this wij adjacency weight matrix. For now, let's consider wij as being equal to 1 if cell i and cell j are adjacent to each other in space, and 0 otherwise. We can algorithmically determine if cell I and cell J are adjacent using a Voronoi tessellation approach and visualize these adjacency relationships with a red line in this graph representation. Now let's consider a single gene, gene 1, which visually looks quite spatially coordinated in its expression pattern. Let Xi be the expression of this gene in cell I, and Xj its expression in cell J, with X bar as the average expression across our n cells. Note that in the Moran's I statistic, Wij is multiplied to xi minus x bar, multiplied to xj minus x bar, and summed across all combinations of cells i and j. Consider these two cells i and j. They're adjacent to each other, so wij is 1, and their gene expression magnitude is lower than average, as shown in blue, resulting in a negative value for xi minus x bar and xj minus x bar. Two negative numbers multiplied together is positive, so these two cells will contribute positively to the Moran's I statistic for this gene. Now let's consider these two other cells I and J. The gene expression magnitude for cell I is lower than average, as shown in blue, resulting in a negative value for Xi minus X bar, but for cell J is higher than average, as shown in red, resulting in a positive value for Xi minus X bar. A negative number multiplied to a positive number is negative, but keep in mind Wij. In this case, wij is 0 because these two cells are not adjacent to each other. So these two cells actually do not contribute anything to the Moran's I statistic for this gene. If we loop through all possible combinations of cells i and j and sum up their contributions, the Moran's I statistic for this gene will be generally quite large. See if you can repeat this exercise on your own for gene 2. Now let's consider gene 3, which visually looks quite variable, but not in a spatially coordinated manner. Again, if we go through this exercise of considering all combinations of cell I and cell J and evaluating their contributions, we can see that the Moran's I statistic for this gene will generally be quite small. See if you can apply what we've learned to hypothesize whether the Moran's I statistic will be large or small for the following gene expression patterns. Even though the Moran's I statistic for a particular gene may be quite large, we still need to evaluate whether this is larger than what we expect by chance. We need to evaluate its statistical significance. The expected value and variance for the Moran's I statistic under spatial randomness can be computed. We can therefore compare our observed I statistic for each gene to this theoretical null 
to derive a z-score and associated p-value from a one-sided test. This test is effectively evaluating whether we have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis H0 that a gene is spatially random and is therefore not spatially variable in favor of the alternate hypothesis HA that the gene is exhibiting non-random coordinated spatial variation and therefore can be deemed spatially variable. If we apply such statistical evaluation to our examples, we should be able to find that gene 1 and gene 2 are significantly spatially variable, but gene 3 is not. To more easily evaluate Morang's eye for spatial transcriptomics data, we developed an R package called Morang. So now let's have a hands-on demonstration of how to use Morang to apply Morang's eye to rank spatially variable genes in a spatial transcriptomics data set of the mouse olfactory bulb. Although we have thus far considered WIJ to be a binary adjacency weight matrix based on Voronoi tessellation, there are many other ways we could have defined whether two cells are adjacent to each other. For example, we can consider two cells as adjacent if they're within the k-nearest neighbors. Visualized are some examples of WIJ based on k-nearest neighbors with k equals 3 and k equals 6. Likewise, WIJ doesn't need to be binary. It could also scale with the inverse distance between two cells, perhaps linearly or even quadratically. In our manuscript, we further demonstrate how modifying the weight matrix can allow us to characterize spatial gene expression heterogeneity in 3D across serial sections by specifically defining adjacency relationships across aligned tissue sections, as well as within cell types by restricting the evaluated end cells to only cells of a particular cell type. And with that, I hope that students will take away from this video the importance of understanding these statistics so that we can apply our biological domain-specific knowledge and adapt them to suit our biological analysis goals. Thanks for learning. Additional code tutorials and resources are available in the video description, so please do try it out for yourself. <laughs>